Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, went for a walk this morning. It was a beautiful day outside today here in um, Oregon. Brookings, Oregon, out in the mountainside. Um, it's warming up. We had clear skies. Uh, got to walk both my dogs and eventually I will show, uh, his name is Declan. I will show Declan to the, the body of Christ, the new addition to the family. He's only been with us for a few days. Um, but I was walking both my dogs and talking with the Lord, and it's just such a beautiful day outside today. So hopefully you guys get out there. I plan on to get out there and spend some time with the Lord outside in, in prayer, listening to the Word of God, listening to a Bible study, uh, just listening to some beautiful music and, and talk with the Lord. Um, it's a beautiful day outside. Uh, last night was amazing. Last night was amazing. I got to sit underneath the stars last night, and I was listening to 1 Samuel, okay, going through... And God was showing me some things in 1 Samuel, and I was under the stars, and then I turned off Samuel, and I was like, Lord, there was one shooting star. I was like, I've seen one shooting star. I usually, when I sit out in front of the stars, I like to see three shooting stars, three moving lights minimum, and then that's the time I can come back in. Okay, it's time to come back in. We've been out here for a couple hours. It's time to come back in. Um, one shooting star, and I think two or three moving lights, and I'm sitting there talking to the Lord. I'm thinking, I'm going to come inside. And I start praying with the Lord. And I'm talking, uh, I got into some serious prayer. And uh, he's humbling me in that prayer. And it was amazing. And as I was pray praying to the Lord, looking up at the stars, I saw two more uh, shooting stars whoo, go by as I was praying. And just praising the Lord for everything that he's done for me, everything he's provided for me. Uh, asking him to forgive me for my failings and my faults and the, the times I failed him. Lord, help me to stay on the straight and narrow, okay? That's what this study is all about, brothers and sisters in Christ, is to encourage you to stay on the straight and narrow, to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. That's why the study is, oh, I've been labeling some of these studies lately as, are you looking? Are you looking? Are your eyes on Jesus Christ, or are you getting distracted by the world? Are your eyes on Jesus Christ, or are you getting distracted by your own flesh? Starting to get back into temptation and falling into, uh, falling into temptation and choosing to get back into old addictions and sin and wickedness. Are you failing the Lord? I have sometimes. That's why I, it still eats me up when I sit out there and pray, or I'm sitting outside on the deck during the day praying, or I'm doing work around the house and I'm praying to the Lord. Sometimes I get upset. You know, the number one man, it might seem like I get upset at people like Brian Dunlear because he, he disappointed me and the body of Christ and the Lord and the Word of God. Uh, or maybe I get in a disagreement with, uh, I was watching a Peter Ruckman study and I get in a disagreement with Peter Ruckman. And, oh, you're not right there. And I act like I'm doing a debate. debate we're not supposed to. Like I'm debating Peter Ruckman in my living room, even though it's just one way. Um, but you know the number one person that upsets me and the number one person that gets you know, that, that disappoints me the most. This guy right here. That's why you desperately need prayer. That's why we need to stay in God's Word. And we're going to get in these studies. Are you looking? Am I looking? When I take my eyes off Jesus Christ, I disappoint the Lord. I wind up failing the body of Christ, my brothers and sisters in Christ, not being a good servant to my brothers and sisters in Christ. I fail the Lord. I fail, uh, sometimes you can end up failing the lost world. The people around you, you start falling back into worldliness and sin, the gospel isn't even on your mind to witness to people. You're supposed to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. So, Brother Says Christ, make sure you're still praying, praying, praying. Last night to me was just amazing. The stars, uh, it was a clear day, it's been raining forever, all winter, just rain, 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 and then we get our couple days every once in a while. So, when we get our days, it's beautiful outside, it's clear. And we get those clear nights. I'm out there with a blanket trying to talk with the Lord underneath the stars. Okay. But that's just me. Uh, what the Lord's been doing with me lately, brother says Christ. Continue to pray for me. I'm praying for you. Okay. But let's get into this study. Are you looking? Prove your own selves. This is going to be the intro. Prove your own selves. This is going to be a longer intro than normal. Okay. Turn to 2 Corinthians 13.5. If some of you knew, it's like, I know where, I think I know where he's going to be going with this. If you, if you suggested 2 Corinthians 13, 5, you would be correct. Okay, turn to 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves. 
Whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? You know what reprobate is, brothers of Christ? It's counterfeit. It's fake. It's false. It's worthless. It has no worth. It's worthless. It's meaningless. But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. Why is Paul and them not reprobates? Because they're examining themselves all the time. And they're proving themselves to the people around them. See, the big push today, brothers and Christ, is that we're not allowed to judge. No, we're not allowed to judge. Judge not lest ye be judged. And they take that all out of context when it's talking about hypocritical judgment. See, they ignore the part where it talks about, they ignore the part where it talks about when you remove the moat from your eye, then you can see clearly to take the beam out of the neighbor's eye. They ignore that part. No, no, it's just saying we don't judge, period. That's not what it's saying. It's talking about hypocritical judgment. Right. We are to judge. We, the first person, you know the first person you're supposed to judge, brother, sister, Christ? 13.5, examine yourselves. You know who the first person you're supposed to judge? Who, who's the first person I'm supposed to judge? This guy right here. Anytime I go to correct a brother or sister in Christ, do a teaching correcting the world, you know, or correcting the world, the world needs to get saved. Correcting the body of Christ as a whole when you do Bible studies. You know the first person I'm correcting? This guy right here. You know the first person I'm judging? This guy right here. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. And then I make sure that I'm proving myself. Sometimes I've set a bad example. I pray that I'm only setting good examples. But there are times where I've failed the Lord and I've failed the brethren. If you follow this ministry long enough, you know that's to be true. But I'm trying. Are you trying? But it says here, examine yourselves, prove your own selves. We're going to talk about those two things. Examine yourself. You're judging yourself. Proving yourselves. That's the lost world judging you. That's the saved sinners judging you. That's everyone else looking at you judging you. First thing you do is you judge yourself. Then you're going to get judged by brothers and sisters in Christ. There's going to be judgment, sometimes bad judgment. The lost world, they love to judge us. They like to point out all our little mistakes, all our flaws, and use that as justification not to listen to us or have anything to do with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and His perfect written word. They do. But the first, it starts with you, brother says Christ. You are supposed to judge yourselves. And some people say, well, th this is that salvation. This is just as salvation. And once you've proven yourself, and you've examined yourself, and you've proven yourself, you're good to go. You don't have to do it anymore. Turn to 1 Corinthians 11.28. 1 Corinthians 11.28. First Corinthians eleven twenty eight says here, but let a man examine himself. Here we got it again. Examine himself. What did we read in Second Corinthians thirteen five? Examine yourself. But let every man examine himself, and let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. What's it talking about? Real communion. What's real communion for? Help us to stay on the straight and narrow. Are we judging ourselves? Are you supposed to do communion just once? No. Are you supposed to do communion like the Catholic, the Eucharist? No. That's all, that's all uh, paganism, the way they do it. It's not the Bible way. The Bible way is you eat bread, you drink a, a thing of grape juice, you know, some kind of juice that's, that reminds you of the blood that was shed for you, the body that was beaten beard that was ripped, all the blood that was shed out, what Jesus Christ did for you on Calvary, so you can have a new life, you're supposed to be a new creature in Christ Jesus, how is your walk with the Lord going? Does it line up with this, or does it line up with the world? This is something you're supposed to do all the time. Not every single day, not every week. Usually, you know, some people say at least once a year. I try to do it at least a couple times a year. But this is something that's ongoing, brother says Christ. You're supposed to be examining yourself all the time. Why? Because at any time, you can start slipping away. At any time, you can start becoming part of the falling away. 
I know some great men of God that once stood firm for the Lord, loved the Lord, loved His Word, loved the brethren, knew it. the difference between charity and liberty. They had such a love of the Lord, love of doing His will, pleasing Him, love of His Word, and these great men of God, what's happened in these last days? Some of them have slipped away. They stop examining themselves. They start setting their own standards and seeing if they meet their own standards, and they're straying from this, God's standards. Why do we do that? Because we have to... Brother Jesus Christ, in this study, we're going to be talking about false converts, and we're going to have to judge people, period, whether they're false converts, and to judge these two things. Are they a false convert, or are they a brother in Christ that's fallen away? They both get treated the same. Okay? You, you go back to the gospel. You try to, Someone who's lost needs to get saved. Someone who's saved, who's fallen away, you go back to the gospel and you preach Jesus Christ to them. Why they got saved, who it is that saved them, why they needed to get saved, and who it is they're supposed to be pleasing and serving. Whose will comes first, theirs or, or the person that saved them? Jesus Christ. Okay. But it says here, but let a man examine himself and let him eat of that bread and drink of that, of that cup. Why? Verse 29. This is Corinthians. Remember, Corinthians, you had false converts coming in. And they're bringing all kinds of sin and wickedness in and messing up those that are saved. So why does he say examine yourselves? Prove your own selves. Verse 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. False comfort. So you say, oh, that's not talking about... Read again, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself? We're not... If you're truly saved and born again, you're not appointed to, appointed to God's wrath. We're sealed into the day of redemption. Who is this talking about? False comforts. False brethren. Wolves in sheep's clothing. Coming in to scatter the flock. Mess everyone up and scatter them. Get them away from this. Verse 30. For this cause, for this cause, what's the cause? People aren't examining themselves. They're not proving themselves. They're not examining themselves. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you. Brother, it's this Christ. When you let your guard down and you stop reading this book, you stop studying this book, you stop hiding it in your heart and living it, the flesh gets one over on you. Next thing you know, you're going to be back to doing things you didn't want to do, back into sin and wickedness. You're going to find yourself compromising to go along to get along, compromising with the world. You're going to find yourself doing things the world's way and saying things the world's way. Why is that? Because you stopped examining yourself using this as the foundation and only this. But Jesus Christ, you stop judging, making people, making people who have a profession of faith, you stop making them prove themselves, using this as the foundation. What happens? For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. God gives you, always gives you a chance to judge, not, I say chance, but opportunity. He always gives you an opportunity, brothers and Christ, to judge yourself first before He does. We read that here. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. If you judge yourself, I've had it in my life, brothers and Christ, where I've sinned, I judged myself quickly, I fell on my knees before the Lord, got that sin out, said, Lord, please forgive me, I shouldn't have done that, I was wrong, and God's like, I forgive you. Remember the Bible says if we confess our sins, He's faithful to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's to save sinners. Not the lost world. That's to save sinners. If we would judge ourselves, God oftentimes goes, I forgive you and, and you're done. We're done. Let's just continue our walk with the Lord. That's, we're gonna, I'm just going to focus on your walk. But when we don't judge ourselves and we continue in that sin and wickedness, compromise, worldliness, having idols... And I can go on and on and on. Verse 32. But when we are judged, 
We are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the Lord. We're chastened of the Lord. In the book of Hebrews, it talks about how God will chasten his people as a father would a child. Because he loves you. Now, one thing I've always got to point out every time I talk about that, there's a difference between God chastening someone and them having to go through the consequences of their actions. The Bible says, if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. That's for both saved and lost. There are, we're still under the law of sin. The law of sin and death, we're going to get into it here in a second. But we're still under the law of sin as a saved sinner. There's still physical consequences for our actions down here when we get into sin and wickedness. Okay? You drink tons of alcohol and you start getting cancer. You smoke a lot and you get cancer. That's not chastening of the Lord. That's the consequences of sin. Now let's say you're getting that stuff and God breaks your car down. Tree falls on your house. That could be chastening of the Lord had nothing to do with that, the consequences of that sin. Okay? Be, be careful. Some, you got to use spiritual discernment. Trust the Lord, pray, and use spiritual discernment to say, okay, I, I did something that was stupid, and there was a cost to doing that thing that was stupid. There's a difference, brothers of Christ. There's a difference. Okay? There's chastening of the Lord, and there's the law of sin and death. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. There's consequences for sin. When God chastens you, He does it in a way that you know it's coming from Him, without question. It's happened in my life. Has it happened in yours? There's times where God has chastened me, and it's like, why is this happening to me? This has nothing to do with where I failed the Lord. Why is this happening? And you, what does it do? I fall on my knees, I start talking to the Lord. It humbles me. And the Lord's like, you need to get that sin out of your life. You're not doing this right. You're failing me here. Okay? But it's important from that scripture to understand that if you judge yourself, God won't, won't judge you. When you refuse to judge yourself, examine yourself, prove your own selves, that's when God steps in. And He does it. You know what the Bible says? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Someone who, who's quick to judge themselves, I want to do things right, Lord. You see, some people say, I see some of the brethren say, oh, you're holy. Like the lost world looks at the brethren and say, you're holier than thou. Because we're picky. We want to please God. We want to do what's right with God. But we also fear God. We want to judge ourselves before God does. Okay. 1 Corinthians 2.15. 1 Corinthians 2.15. You don't have to turn here, but it says, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Okay. He that is spiritual Judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. The Holy Spirit is the comforter. He comes in and guides us into all truth. In Romans chapter 8, it talks about the difference between someone who's lost, who's carnally minded, walking after the flesh, versus someone who's saved, who's spiritually minded, and walking after the Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes in, opens God's Word to us. We have a love of God's Word. We have a love of absolute truth. We have a love of the right way, you know, what pleases God. We have a love of God's doing God's will, God's way. Okay. We have a perfect standard in which we can judge. He is spirit of spiritual judgeth all things. We have a Holy Spirit in us, and we have a perfect standard that you can hold me accountable to, Brother Sister Christ, and I can hold you accountable to. These fake false converts out there can't stand that. They don't want anybody judging them. They, don't, they definitely don't want God judging them, and they, they, they're in their own little world. God's not judging me. They don't want you judging them. They don't want to judge themselves. Okay. 1 Corinthians 10.4 says, And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ. Romans 7.14 says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. It takes the Holy Spirit to open this book to you. It takes the Holy Spirit to get you to live a life of Christ. There's a lot of people that like to fake it. They do. They like to fake it. Words. And the only way they're getting away, they're not getting away with it 
all the time. I'm not, like, like God sees everything. They're not getting away with it when it comes to God. But how are people able to fool people today? I mean, seriously, Brother Christ, look out there. I'm pointing to the internet, computers. You go out there on the internet, you look at it. How are all these false converts, these wolves in sheep's clothing, able to fool, fool everyone? Because they've done away with 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Just take me at my word. It's all about words, no deeds. They take judgment off the board. And when you do that, you can be easily fooled. There's a lot of people who talk the talk. I come across a lot of people that talk the talk. But do they walk the walk? That's the difference. That's where examine yourself. That's where prove your own selves. If we would judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. Do you walk the walk? Okay. It's the Holy Spirit that comes in and opens the scriptures to us. Romans 8, 4 says that, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the capital S, Spirit. You mean the mark of someone who's truly saved is that their walk lines up with this, the Word of God? How do we know that? John 16, 13 says, How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, talking about the Holy Spirit, is come, He will guide you into all truth, for He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. God the Father speaks to us by His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and tells us this is truth. This is the do's, this is the don'ts, the instruction in righteousness. The Bible says all scriptures given by God in its presence. All scripture is given by God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction. You know, half of what it mentions, reproof, correction, has to do with judging. For reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Doctrines, what we're supposed to believe in the stance that we take. Instruction in righteousness, how we're supposed to live. How Paul, Paul talks about, are we supposed to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How we that are dead to sin live any longer therein. God's given us his, his Holy Spirit. He's given us his word to tell us how to live right. How are we supposed to be living in wicked sin and look just like the lost world as a saved sinner? You're not. Paul starts warning us about false comforts. Okay. John 14, 6, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. First thing you do, brother and sister Christ, is you examine yourselves. The Holy Spirit comes in and starts examining yourself. How many of us, brother and sister Christ, have a testimony that when we were newly saved, our life was a complete mess, and boy, did God have a lot of work to do. I'll raise both hands. That's me. That's this man right here. I had a lot of sin, a lot of wickedness. I was doing a lot of things the wrong way. My priorities were all messed up. God came in and He saved me. Salvation comes first. The changed life comes afterwards. The lost world can't stand that. These easy believers and these false uh, brethren, wolves and sheep's clothes, they can't stand it. They like their easy believism. There is no changed life. I don't have to prove myself. Who are you to judge me? But is this Christ? We're to examine ourselves. That's the first step. Are you examining yourself? We're going to get into this study. Okay? We're going to show you how to examine yourself. We're going to show how people are supposed to be proving themselves one to another. Now we get to the next part. You don't have to turn back, but 2 Corinthians 13, 5, when we read examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, it says, prove your own selves. Some people don't get, what does it mean to prove your own self? How about we go back to an example in the Old Testament? Maybe that's the Old Testament. Yeah, well, the Bible likes to define the Bible. Okay, That's what I like about the Bible, the Word of God. It defines itself. Genesis 42, 15. Genesis 42, 15. Now, that's the first time the word proved, what adds an ED to it. Not prove, but proved. Okay? Genesis 42, 15. There we go. 
Hereby ye shall be proved. This is God talking to the Jewish people through Moses. Hereby ye shall be proved. I'm sorry, sorry, I got the wrong verse. Uh, I was thinking of another verse we'll be getting to. Hereby ye shall be proved. By the life of Pharaoh ye shall not go forth hence, except your younger brother come hither. This is um, Joseph. Sorry, Brother Christ. This is Joseph, the youngest brother, the second to the youngest, because Benjamin's the youngest, of the twelve sons of Jacob. He says, I'm going to prove you. What they're saying is, is they said we have a younger brother and he's still alive. His name, I don't know if his name is Benjamin. He's alive. He's like, I'm going to prove you. They have their words. See, proving doesn't mean you have to show, you know, action or anything. No. They had their words. They said, hey, we have a younger brother. He still lives. That's their words. But Joseph doesn't know that to be true. His brother and brethren have already lied to him. They sold him into slavery. He doesn't know that. So what does he say? Hereby ye shall be proved. How are they being proved? By the life of Pharaoh ye shall not go forth hence, except your younger brother come hither. Send one of you, and let him fetch your brother, and ye shall be kept in prison, that your words may be proved. Oh, no, no, we're just supposed to go off of words. That's how people get deceived. The Bible talks about with good words and fair speeches, deceiving the hearts of the simple. Here we see in the Bible that your words may be proved. Are you all talk? Where's the walk? And in this situation, how, did they how they were, were they going to be able to prove themselves that they were telling the truth? Bring your brother here and let me see him. Action. Works. Deed. Whether there be any truth in you, that your words may be proved, whether there be any truth in you. Or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely ye are spies. Joseph. Okay. This is a great definition. What's proving mean? There's an action that you got to take to prove yourself. That what your words, what you're saying is true. There's supposed to be works, there's supposed to be deeds that line up with your talk. If your works and your deeds don't line up with your talk, you're a liar. You're a deceiver. You are spies. Wolves in sheep's clothing. Now, I got ahead of myself. Turn to Exodus 15. That's with Moses. That's the one with Moses. Exodus 15. Prove your own selves. That's what we're supposed to do today. What's the definition of proving yourself? There's an action you got to take that lines up with your talk. With your words. People online can really talk the talk. People in these battle buildings that stand behind a pulpit with a nice suit and tie, boy, they can talk the talk sometimes. But are they walking the walk? Right? Exodus 15, 24. Exodus 15, verse 24. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made... For them, a statue and an ordinance. Okay, they came across the river that was bitter, some water that was bitter. It was undrinkable. Today we use the word potable. It's not potable. Okay, it's not drinkable. And instead of saying, Moses, ask God to help us. We need some water. Ask the Lord to be merciful to us. Can we get some water somewhere? Instead, they murmured against him. You get that among a lot of the professing Christians out there. When things aren't going their way and it's not perfect, do they fall on their knees to God saying, Lord, help us. Lord, show us the way. Or do they start whining and complaining a lot? Start pointing the finger at everybody else. It's that Moses guy. It's his fault. Oh, yeah. He says the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statue and an ordinance because they keep whispering against Moses, but what they're really doing is whispering against God. They're not trusting God. And there he proved them and said, here's the proving part, he proved them and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to, my, to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, action. 
deeds, works, and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statues, I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. He said, there's proof of them, their action. If you do this, I won't do this. I'm going to prove you. Mm -hmm. Exodus 20. Turn to Exodus 20. There we have another example of what proving means. They said, oh, we will follow you, Lord. Yes, you're the one true God. Yes, we'll do what you want. Then they, they look like they're going to run out of water, and they instantly turn on God. Like that. Oh, we're running out of food. They turn on God. Oh, all we've been eating is bread all day. They turn on God. We want meat. We want meat. They turn on God. He's like, I'm going to prove you to see if you're, that you're sincere. Because you guys do talk the talk, but your walk isn't lining up with the talk. Therefore, I'm going to prove you. Exodus 20. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. That includes your Christmas tree there. You know who you are. Okay? Any graven images. Any. Anything that can become an idol. But this is talking about actual physical things where you take it, and the lost world turns it into an idol and says, hey, this is an idol. The lost world worships it. It's an idol. Okay, We're not supposed to have any images of God in any way, shape, or form. The Bible, this is a whole other study, but the Bible talks about the, um, that the, the Godhead is not likened to any graven images. And it goes through and talks about all these images. And who's the image of the Godhead? Jesus Christ. We're not supposed to have relics and holy relics and images of God today. Okay. But back then, you're not supposed to have any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I am the Lord thy God and am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. I wanted to read all these things about these are the commandments God's giving. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. The Ten Commandments right here. Got the same thing right here. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Okay. Back then you had holy days and Sabbath days and new moon. You had specific days that God ordained, commanded you to keep them, and there was a, he taught you how to keep them, when to keep them, why to keep them, and that there was, certain, there was punishment for not keeping them. There's a consequence. Six days, thou, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughters, thy maidservants, nor thy thy manservants, nor thy maidservants, nor thy cattle, nor, nor thy stranger that is within the, thy gates. For in the six days the Lord made heaven and earth and sea, and all that were in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Honor thy mother and father. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. So the brethren have a hard time with that one. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his maidservant, or manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And all the people saw the thundering and the lightning. Remember, the glory of the Lord is, is, is manifests itself in what? Clouds, fire, and light. And we always talk about image-wise. But sound 
Thunder, they always talk about thundering. The lost world hears thundering. At the catch away of the body of Christ, the lost world hears thundering. What do we hear? We hear God say, Philip Newton, come up hither. The lost world just hears thundering. It's a, it's, it's, it's a whole other study, but they tended to hear thundering a lot when God would show up. I wonder why that is, because a lot of them, their hearts were hardened. They kept trying to go back to Egypt, the world. They were all talk, not walk. Lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. There's the smoke, smoke or cloud. So with the glory. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off and said unto Moses, Speak thus, thou with us, and we will hear thee. And we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you. There's all his commandments. Are you going to follow him? He's coming here to prove you. That his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto me gods of gold. Okay. Verse 24, An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings, and thy peace offerings, thy sheep, and thine oxen, and all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, not a wooden tree, of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. He's proving him. Here's my laws. Okay? Here's how you do animal sacrifices. You do a stone altar. No tools are supposed to be upon it. Now how would it look for them to say, Okay, this is right. We love you, Lord. You're the right way. Just help us and give us what we want. And we'll do what you want, Lord. And yet they don't follow any of these commandments. They build trees and they, they, they cut down trees and deck them with gold and silver and give gift offerings underneath. Wait a minute. They had a profession. We'll do it your way. Your way is the right way. But indeed, they would be doing the opposite. And if you read all the stories of what's going on here, eventually they get to the point where they do fall away. They don't follow God's commandments. They don't do the animal sacrifices the way God said to do them. They start doing them the heathen way. The lost world's way. That's why I push this so much, Brother Scrape. Are you doing things God's way? God's will? What pleases God? Or are you doing things the world's way? But the important thing for this study, Brother Scrape, is Exodus 20:20, 20, 20, where it reads, it says, And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you. What does it mean to prove your own selves? It's action. It's deeds. Do your actions and do your deeds line up with your words? More importantly, because the lost worlds does, but does your action and your deeds line up with the word of God? Because some people will try to pervert the word of God to justify their actions and their deeds. And God's against them. Okay? Be careful about that. Okay? But what does it mean to prove yourself? It's action. You can't get away from it. Okay? Psalms 119, you don't have to turn here, but we're going to go through some verses. Psalms 119, 47. And I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I, lo which I have loved. My hands also will I lift up unto thy commandments, which I have loved, and I will meditate in thy statutes. This comes from King David. Did King David fail the Lord? We have a talking where we talk about the... Uh, called Bible by the Fire, and one of the Psalms, we read the whole thing, go through it, and show how King David felt when he failed the Lord when it came to his commandments and not doing things his, his way, trying to please God and do things God's way. It tore King David apart. 
his failings, his faults, his, his sin, his wickedness, when he failed God, I mean, he committed adultery, had a man murdered to cover it up. But this is how you know someone who loves the Lord. You can still make mistakes, brother, says Christ, but what's your heartfelt desire? To please God. To do His will. That was King David's. I will delight myself in thy commandments. Psalms 119, 127, we read, Therefore I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. You know what the world tries to do, brother, says Christ? They try to tempt you with things to get you to turn your back on God's word. Living your dream life. Having a dream family. Having a dream job. Being famous. Having money. The world's always trying to throw something at you. Trying to bribe you into turning your back on this book. What does King David say? Therefore I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. There's no amount of money, wealth, uh, fleshly pleasures in this world that will get me to turn my back on God. I might fail the Lord sometimes, I'll stumble, I will fall, but nothing in this world is going to get me to turn my back on God and His perfect written word. That's a good stance to take, brother, says Christ. It's a stance I try to take every day. It's a constant stance. You've got to keep judging yourself. You've got to keep examining yourself. Make sure you're making that stand. And it's not just talk. Where's the walk? King David had the walk. He failed the Lord, but he had the walk. Most of his life, pleasing God, doing His commandments, doing things His way. John 15.10 says, If we keep His commandments, ye shall abide in my love. If ye keep my commandments, says Jesus Christ, ye sh shall abide in my love, and even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love. Oh, I love Jesus Christ. How many times have you heard people say that? I love Jesus Christ out there. Well, what Jesus Christ? Well, the easiest way to figure that one out, out is when you hit them about this. What's their attitude towards the commands of God? Jesus is God. The Father manifests in the flesh. What's their attitude towards absolute truth when it comes to someone being an authority over them telling them what to do? This is what's right. This is what's wrong. The Bible says that if a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. 1 John 5, 2 says, But this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and keep His commandments, for this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. The ultimate commandment today is obey the gospel. When you get saved and born again, your heartfelt desire, your proof that you love God, is you do your best to keep His commandments, to keep His word. You hide His word in your heart and you live it. He's an authority over you. He's the chief. He's the captain. He's the king. He's king of kings and lord of lords. People will say that in word, but are they living that way? When a king gives a command, do you follow him? Are you willing to follow that king's commands even unto death? Second John 1 John 1.6 we read, And this is the love that we walk after his commandments. Notice this is 1 John and 2 John. This is the Old Testament. They're like, oh, that's all. This is, this is the New Testament. This is for us today. And this is the love that we walk after His commandments. This is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Talking about loving one another, having love for the brother and sisters in Christ. You're supposed to have a love for God's Word, a love for absolute truth. You have to, you have to have that heartfelt desire. True love for God is having that heartfelt desire to please God and to do His will. Have some of you, has that started fading a little bit, brother, says Christ? Or is that still strong here? That heartfelt desire, that love, that real love for, for Jesus Christ. Yeah. There's more examples in the Bible of proving yourself in the old Bible. By all means, do a word study. I encourage you to do a word study on, on the word prove. 
P-R-O-V-E slash proved. It has to do with action. There's something like that's set up to, so you can prove yourself. Okay. Um, today, a good example would be if someone comes to you and says, I am an artist and I can paint, you know, the mountainside. And when I'm done, that painting looks so real. You say, okay, here's a clear canvas. Here's some paint. I'm going to stand here and I'm going to watch you go. What's going on? You're making him prove what he just said. Oh, your car's broke, your truck, the engine's broken down. Oh, I can rebuild that engine for you and get it up and running and everything. Okay, here's the tools. There's the engine. I'm sitting here and I'm watching. Now prove it. Let me see. That's what proving is, brothers and Christ. You can't get around it. When Paul says prove your own selves, it's action, it's deed, it's judgment. But people always try to get around it. So, brothers and sisters of Christ, how do we that are in the faith, you know, he says, examine yourself whether you be in the faith. How are we that are in the faith? Another way to say it is in Christ Jesus. How do we prove one another? How do we examine ourselves and how do we prove one another? There's a great verse in the Bible. Turn to 1 Corinthians 1.21. 1 Corinthians 1.21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Someone was lost. It pleased God by the foolishness of the preaching to save them that believe. God came to save all those that believe. I'm not into this thing where you're, you're ordained, you were either going to be a Christian or not, you have no, uh, you know, Calvinism. But when the Bible, when they try to lean it towards Calvinism, it's not what the Bible's going. The direction the Bible's going is that all them that believe. Anyone, God gives everyone a choice. Those who choose to believe, repent and believe, those are the ones he came to save. That's what the Bible's saying. And you'll have someone come along and take that and say, no, 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 it's saying predestinated. They're predestinated to be saved. That's all garbage. Don't fall for that garbage. Preaching to save them that believe. For the Jew require a sign and the Greek seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. They always, they're always saying, God, that's just so foolish. You might think, the world might think this is foolish, but it's wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. We're going to break these down a little bit here in a second. Verse 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Now when it's talking about our call, it's talking about those that, get, that believe. In this day and age, you're not going to see a lot of uh, wise men after the flesh get saved. You have to be broken. That's what repentance is. You have to come broken. Instead of going back to establish your own righteousness, or you have that attitude, well, yeah, I'm a sinner, but I'm, just not, I'm not as bad as other men are. I'm not as bad as this publican. Some of you know where that comes from in the Bible, if you know your Bible. Okay. Not many mighty... People who, you like said, you got to become broken. I'm weak. I'm worthless. I don't have the strength. I can't do it on my own. But when you have people that are mighty, they don't, they don't tend to come to believe. They don't get saved. Not many noble are called. I'm someone special. I'm the exception. You know, the Catholic Pope calls himself the Vicar of Christ. He thinks he's the exception. He's special. He doesn't have to go the he doesn't have to get saved the same way everyone else does. Uh, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world and which and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. 
Now, 1 Corinthians 1.30, the next verse, 1 Corinthians 1.30, it says, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus. But, all that gets negated, that's lost. That's the world. That's the way the world thinks. That's the world. When you see but, it negates everything in front of it because it, it's saying that stuff's not the important stuff. Yes, it's okay. It's there in the Word of God. We need to hear it. But here's the important part. But, of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us, who, whom of God has made unto us, we're going to stop there for a second, whom of God has made unto us. What's being talked about when it says made unto us? Ephesians, hold your hands there. Turn to Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. We read here, For we are his workmanship, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us, made. For we are his workmanship, workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. See, they don't like Ephesians 2.10. They like Ephesians 2.8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's salvation. They love that. But they don't love what comes after salvation. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's 2 Corinthians 5.17. John 3.3, 3, you know, I've turned there. It says, Jesus answered, said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now remember then, they were talking about the uh, kingdom of heaven, the day of the Lord. Sometimes God would be talking about the spiritual kingdom of God, that fellowship. Sometimes he'd be talking about the physical kingdom, and you need to discern between the two. But the point is, is born again. Except ye repent, ye all will likewise perish. 1 Peter 1.23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed. Oh no, you're saved. You can continue living the old man. You can continue ignoring God's commands and doing things your way. No chastening of the Lord. You're just so worldly. You can't tell the difference between you and the lost world. That's okay. That's not what Peter says. Being born again, not of corruptible seed. That old man is dead and buried with Jesus Christ. The new man is raised. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever by the word of God. You get saved and born again. We said it like time and time again. The Holy Spirit comes in. He opens this book to you, and he teaches you how to live. He teaches you what's right and what's wrong. He teaches you what's absolute truth. Our faith is supposed to be in the doctrines of the Bible. Okay. Go back to 1 Corinthians 1.30. Remember, it says God has made into us. There's a new creature. There's a new birth. You have a new life. And that life is what? We're going to read, it's in Christ. But if him are ye in Christ Jesus. Go, I forgot to put my hand there, so... I gotta turn all the way back. 1 Corinthians 30. We'll flip back over to 1 Corinthians 30. Let's read this. How can what's the best way to prove ourselves? To examine ourselves and to prove ourselves. Here it is right here. 1 Corinthians 1 30. I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 1 chapter 1 verse 30. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. That's what I love about the Bible. It gives us a definition. What does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? Who of God has made unto us, made unto us, were changed. The old man is dead and buried. Made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. 
Now, sorry for the long intro, okay? I just wanted to point out that the Bible, that Paul says we're to prove, examine ourselves, we're to prove ourselves. What does it mean to examine ourselves? Communion. Prove ourselves. Why? Because we're going to be judged. We can judge ourselves first, or God will judge us, or we're going to get judged by brothers and sisters in Christ. We're going to get judged by the lost world. Are we setting a good example for the lost world? Are we being a light for Jesus Christ to the lost world? Judgment is there. We need to prove ourselves. Okay? You have some people that say, I don't care. Well, you should, according to the scriptures. But we see there, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus. How do you examine yourself whether ye are in the faith? Are you in Christ Jesus? See, I used to believe the word Christian just means you follow Christ. Those are people that follow. Actually, the Bible definition of Christian is someone who's in Christ. Okay. Are you a real Christian? But of him are ye in Christ. Are you in Christ? Anytime you say, I'm a Christian, you're saying, I'm in Christ. Is that true? Is it just your words? Or do you, are you proving yourselves? Does your life line up with this book, God's perfect written word, the King James Bible? Does your life line up with this so you, that your life lines up with your words? Your words need to line up with this. Your walk needs, and your life needs to line up with this. Are you in Christ Jesus? What's the definition of someone who's in Christ Jesus? Whom of God has made unto us wisdom. Okay, wisdom. What we read back there, we said, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. We're going to go into each one of these in depth in this series. Okay, we're going to talk about wisdom. What's, God, what's your attitude towards absolute truth? Are you taking that absolute truth and applying it to your life? But notice here it says, unto us, he given us wisdom. But the world doesn't want that wisdom. That's why it says, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. They don't want this. They say we're foolish. They laugh at us. They mock us. They deride us. From believing that there's a perfect written word of God, and God, God, the one true God, he's the final authority. He's the ultimate judge. It's his way that matters. And I need to line up with him. He is in me, and I am in him. Okay. Righteousness. But God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Remember we read about that? The reason people don't get saved? We read that up there? We'll do it again. Okay. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, over here, God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. When I'm weak, then am I strong? God says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Is God's word, capital W word and lowercase w word, are those the strength that's in your life? Are you hiding them in your heart? Do you have... Jesus Christ, which is the Holy Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, you have Jesus Christ. Do you hide His Word in your heart and live it? See, that confounds the world. They're all trying to make it on their own strength. Here's all these weak people going to heaven. Are you weak? Then heaven's the place to be. If you think you're mighty and strong and... and wise after the, after the flesh, you're trying to make it by establishing your own righteousness, you're never going to make it. If you don't humble yourself and repent, come broken. I'm, I can't do it. There's no strength. There's no way I can make it to heaven on my own. Sanctification. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. The number one reason, I don't care what anybody says, I do care what brethren say, correct me if I'm wrong, prove me wrong. The number one reason why somebody won't get saved is they don't want to give up sin. They don't want sanctification. Why do you think this false gospel out there, this easy believism, is so popular out there? They don't have to give up sin. Sanctification. Sin is not that big of a deal. 
sin is okay. And they think they can find a, another way into heaven a, a, to get a free pass into heaven. And based on the things of the world and the things which are despised that God chosen, the world despised this book. Why? Because it tells us how we're supposed to live. It commands us. It's not a suggestion. I've come across, when I was lost, there were people that said, oh, the Bible is just a guideline. Just giving us good suggestions. No, it's a command of God. We are commanded to live His way and to do things His way. It's a command. But the world despises that. They don't want sanctification. They don't want to be clean. You remember in uh, John 3.16, they love 3.16, but you keep reading it, it says that how men love darkness rather than light, and they don't want the light shining on them lest their deeds should be reproved. Despised. Redemption. Things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Someday we're going to be caught up and we're going to be fully redeemed. Right now I'm not redeemed. This wicked body of flesh. Oh, yeah. Someday I'm going to get a new body, praise the Lord, and we're going to be redeemed. But the world doesn't want to be redeemed. They like things the way they are. They don't want to give it up. And like I said, we're going to go through that, brothers and Christ. We're going to hit all four of those. So next part, part one of this study, is we're going to go over wisdom. How do you uh, examine yourself and prove yourself? Uh, righteousness. Salvation. Jesus' righteousness is imputed to you. Do, uh, that God is right, having the attitude of that heartfelt desire that, to do God's will, uh, to please God, that God is right. His way is the right way. That's what righteousness is. Right in God's eyes. Are you right in God's eyes? Okay. And uh, sanctification. We're going to talk about that. How's the sanctification going on in your life? How's the wisdom? How's the, the first part? How's the Bible? How's your Bible reading going? How's your Bible studying going? How's your faith in this book going? How's your faith in Jesus Christ? And the last, last one on here is redemption. What's people's attitude toward looking for that blessed hope? Present tense. People always say that the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ, is not a salvation issue. It's not a salvation issue. But it's how you prove whether you're in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You're only two-thirds redeemed. Are you looking every day with the life that you're living for the day when God will fully redeem you and bring you home? Redemption. What's your attitude towards it? Why are all four of these important? Because all four of these, when you have someone who, who has all four of these things down, as we get through this study, Brothers of Christ, when you have someone that's got all four of those things down, you know what happens? They tend to give God glory in everything. Remember what it said? That no flesh should glory in His presence. Verse 29. We read there in verse 29 of 1 Corinthians 1, 29. It says that no flesh should glory in His presence. That's talking about the lost world. The lost world loves the glory and God in the flesh, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. It's in the Bible talking about the lost world. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. But they glorify in their shame, their sin, their wickedness. In the end, no flesh is going to glory. Everyone's going to have to stand before God. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Everyone's going to have to answer to God someday, brother, says Christ. They think they can just glory in their flesh right now. No, no. But that's for the lost, that no flesh should glory in his presence. That's what they try to do. They do. They try to glory in his presence. What about the saved? Jump down to 31. That as according as is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. That's saved. I'm telling you, when people have it down where they've got all four, that's right here, they got all four of those things down, have it highlighted. When they've got the wisdom down, when, they're, when it's about God's will, God's word, they have a faith and a belief in a God, perfect written word, and they take God's word and they hide it in their heart and they do their best to live it, and they're keeping their eyes on Jesus Christ. That sums all this up, keep their eyes on Jesus Christ. 
and lives every day for him because he could come back tomorrow. They're keeping their eyes on him. The thing about the re redemption of the purchased possession is that if you live every day as if Jesus Christ can come back tomorrow, what am I going to get done for him today? That's a good attitude. He could come back tomorrow. I need to get busy for him today. What are you doing for him today? Did you pray today? Did you start your day with the Word of God? Do you end your day with the Word of God? Do you pray? Do you watch Bible studies or do your own Bible study? Do you go gospel tracting? When you're working, whether it's working with your hands and stuff, do you still talk with the Lord? Are you giving God glory in all things? Are you giving God thanks in all things? Okay. I also put in here assurance of salvation. The people that have the greatest assurance of salvation is the people that have those four things down. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Those people that are living their lives for Jesus Christ, taking His Word, hiding in their heart, and living it, and they always have their eyes on that blessed hope. Jesus Christ. They don't seem to doubt their salvation. The ones that doubt their salvation is when they start falling away from these four points. People that could be saved, that start falling away from those four points. Next thing they know, they start doubting their salvation. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. Colossians 3.17, I'm not going to turn here, but you can pause the video and turn. Colossians 3.17. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Let him that glorieth, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Everything you do is for the Lord, that you might please Him. Ephesians 5.20 Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You give thanks for everything. You give God glory in everything. I got with I got into it with some professing brethren in the past that couldn't let go of their video games. Their Hollywood movies, TV shows, anime, cartoons, satanic style music. They couldn't let go of the world. Sin and wickedness. And we got into it because they're so far gone, they think that they can actually give God glory and give God thanks in that filth and wickedness. I'm sorry, but when you have someone like that, I'm going to err on the side of caution, and I'm going to treat them like they're lost, and I'm going to go back to the gospel. Okay? If you can't give God thanks for what you're doing, how you're doing it, give God glory for what you're doing, or how you're doing it, then you shouldn't be doing it. I mean, in these Babel buildings, you've got immodestly dressed women, and they think they can give God glory and thanks in them. My my ex-wife, she was smart she was smart enough to me, but she was saying I can give God glory and thanks for giving me the money to buy liquor, alcohol to get drunk. If you can't truly give God glory and give God thanks, you shouldn't be doing it. We have studies on that, brothers of Christ on this in this in the ministry that God allowed me to be part of. Romans 16, 27 says, To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Are you giving God the glory? Does He come first in your life? If you're mastering those four things that we're going to get into, then God will be coming first in your life. You'll be giving God all the glory. Your heartfelt desire is going to be strong and it's going to show through your actions and your deeds that pleasing God and doing His will come first in your life. Psalms 43, and he, and he hath put a new song in my mouth. I was reading this in the Psalms, so I threw this in here. Psalms 43, 40, verse 3. Chap, uh, Psalms 40, verse 3. Sometimes I say things like 40 or 20, and then you have a number. It sounds like you're saying 200 and something, or 400, or 43. It's 40, verse 3. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. What is that? That's an example of somebody who's truly saved and born again and their whole life, not just in words, but their whole life gives God glory. And you know what? The lost world sees it. 
And it leads people to Christ. People get saved. Brothers and sisters of Christ, I'm, it could be just me, but I'm starting to get, I'm getting sick and tired of everyone that I, I'm, I'm dealing with a lot of people that I'm getting sick and tired of the preaching of the gospel being verbal and only verbal. Yes, preaching is verbal. Yes, we're to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. But we're supposed to be a living witness as well. We're supposed to be a light to this dark world. You lead people to Christ not just by your words, but by your deeds. They both are important. But deeds have been erased, and it's just your word today. That's all that matters is your word. Just your word. You don't have to prove yourself. You don't have to examine whether you be in the faith. You don't have to live a life of Christ and actually be a living witness to the lost world. Pardon me. A living witness to the lost world. The Bible says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Prove? Who are you proving it to? The world. That's why you don't conform to the world, so you can prove to the world what is the one true way. The only way to get saved. The only way to heaven. You prove by not conforming to the world. Love not the world, neither things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The lost world will not see the love of the Father in you if you start loving things of this world more than you love God. Pleasing the world, people in the world, pleasing yourself, doing the will of the world, and people in the world, and doing your own will, when that starts coming first, people don't see Jesus Christ in you. But they do when God comes first. And His will comes first, and pleasing Him comes first. And you're separate from the world. It's a big difference, brother and sister Christ. So, we're going to get into this study. Examine yourself, prove your own selves. The next part of this series, and we might have some, we're going to have videos that might come out in between this series, uh, as we're going along in this series. But the next part of the series is wisdom. Where does our wisdom come from? If you're examining yourself, you got to examine yourself and say, Is my wisdom coming from myself, men? My flesh? You know how your flesh likes to whisper at you? And we're going to use scripture to back it up. Is it coming from your flesh? Is your wisdom coming from the world? Or is your wisdom coming by the Holy, from God's word by the Holy Ghost? So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I pray you're enjoying these beautiful days that we're getting. I hope... I know it's just not everyone's getting these days, but when there's beautiful days, get out there and spend time with the Lord and His Word and in prayer. Get out there and do some good work with your hands that pleases God, that you can give God glory and give Him thanks in all things. I'm praying for you, brothers and sisters Christ. Please keep praying for me, and I will see you in the next study.